We are going to hear from Julia Garrayo next on the chapter that uh, about this subject. Julia, when you when you're comfortable. So, uh, as Sophia uh, has already mentioned, Uncover carries out research that began uh, with the project uh, Decodem in the thematic area about uh, Me Too. We organized at that time, we organized two round tables um, online about Me Too in Portugal and the practices of covering sexual violence in Portuguese media with scholars and journalists. And we conducted research mainly, our research was mainly about two national cases which interacted with the global Me Too. So the Gaia verdict and the rape allegation against Cristiano Ronaldo. From this research uh, resulted two articles and the chapter that Sofia, Inés, Rita and myself that we wrote for the Routledge, Routledge Companion on Gender, Media and Violence, uh, which is organized by Karen, Karen Boyle, our consultant. So uh, let me just briefly um, present some insights from this chapter, which is our most systematic incursion on the topic of, uh, of Uncover. Uh, while providing an overview of uh, trends and patterns of sexual violence uh, news coverage in Portugal, we focused our attention on four of the most mediatic rape stories in the first two decades of the 21st century. The Casa Pia Ring of Sexual Exploitation of Minors, the Telheiras Rapist, the Gaia Verdict and the Rape Allegation against the national football icon Cristiano Ronaldo. We examine how these stories were covered by mainstream media and mapped the diversity of journalism practices that were mobilized, aiming to explore how rape stories are framed and mediated in Portuguese media. Now, a um, few words about sexual violence in Portugal regarding law and media coverage in general. Uh, studies on Portuguese media and judiciary, judiciary, and I'm referring mostly to the work of our consultant uh, Isabel Ventura, show that patriarchal conceptions of masculinity, femininity and sexual morality and the enacting of traditional hierarchies of pri privilege and discrimination regarding class, gender, race and nationality continue to determine who is perceived as a sexual offender and who is credible as a rape victim. Uh, on the victim's uh, side, women whose accusations are validated in court tend to conform to a specific pattern. Modesty regarding class, uh, address code and social attitudes, no signs of so-called sexual promiscuity, the exhibition of marks of inflicted violence providing physical approving physical resistance, a social status that is superior to the rapists. On the perpetrator's side, men convicted of sexual crimes tend to be associated with marginality, deviancy and or social subalternity. So unemployed, low paid jobs, single, without sexual appeal from minorities, psychotic and or uneducated. Journalism often validates many of these rape scripts. A study also by Isabel Ventura uh, on a, based, based on a sample of news from the period 2007-2011 observed, uh, uh, 14, sorry, uh, observed the following trends in Portuguese newspapers. A tendency to mediate rape stories as police cases and individual dramas derived from the sexual aggressors dysfunctionality and monstrosity, predominance of short texts which do not include inputs from specialists and scientific literature, nor a discussion of legal procedures to prosecute rape, absence of information regarding institutions that offer support services for victims, sexual violence as a social phenomenon related to other forms of violence against women, hence remains largely unarticulated. Well, this is, uh, as I said, this, this refers to a study that was published in 2014. I think that in the meantime, we can observe some, some changes, but this, was, this is a, a, a study from the beginning of the century. Perceived as single events, sex crimes are mostly related to sections devoted to crime in sensationalist media with voyeuristic perspectives. Titles are aimed at catching the reader's attention through shock and awe. 
rape stories with particularly gruesome details involving physical violence and or transgression of family morals, for example, incest, pedophilia, are therefore more likely to catch media attention. Sexual violence is rendered visible as a, um, as a social and or a, a pathological deviancy, especially among deprived classes, and commodified as a spectacle of horrors, which ultimately reconforts society and its social norms. So the rapist is the other among us who may have succeeded in hiding his monstrosity for a long period, but who ultimately does not represent our models of sexuality and masculinity. The reproduction of rape scripts and myths in Portuguese media is, not un, is though not unchallenged. There are many examples of media practices that frame, that frame rape as a social problem related to broader cultural practices, gender inequality, and patriarchal thinking. Uh, and we are thinking about um, several journalism, journalists, for example, I'm, we, we just referred a few examples, uh, Fernanda Cancio, who writes for Diário de Notícias, Paula Cosme Pinto, who wrote, who used to write for Expresso, and Aline Flor, who writes for Publico. They are, um, all, all the three of them are respected, well-known journalists who work for the most important national newspapers, contributing with their investigative journalism, for uh, Aline Flor, for instance, and their columns, the case of um, uh, Paula Cosme Pinto and Fernanda Cancio, to the informed discussion of gender-based violence and the deconstruction of rape myths. Uh, the analysis of four of the most mediatic cases of rape or rape allegations of the first two decades of the 21st century in Portugal exposed precisely this tension. So that was why we chose these four uh, cases for the chapter. The Casa Pia investigation and the Telheiras rapist revealed the strengths of the monstrosity deficiency script even when the alleged or the rapists or the alleged aggressors do not conform to the dominant imaginary of the rapist. The comparative examination of the two highly mediatized 2018 cases, so the Gaia verdict and the rape allegation against Cristiano Ronaldo, signaled the instability of rape in Portuguese media coverage, that is how the reproduction of rape myths coexists with journalism's practices that try to challenge these assumptions. Now, moving to the Casapia case. So sexual violence gained significant uh, attention in Portuguese society and media uh, in 2002, when allegations of a ring of sexual abuse and trafficking of minors run by the employees of Casa Pia, a state-run institution for orphans and poor children, led to an investigation and a highly mediated trial that lasted more than five years and culminated in the conviction in 2010 of, among others, a media celebrity and a former ambassador. ambassador. Since the case involved powerful and famous uh, men, including a uh, minister, uh, the media had to deconstruct the perception of the pedophile as a monster who could be easily identified on the street. So this imaginary of the pedophile that you can spot, uh, while at the same time, media tended to depict the suspected pedophiles as sneaky monsters. However, Precisely because the media focused on the most mediatic personalities involved in investigation, including the minister, public opinion remained deeply polarized and absorbed by the political meaning of the trial. So on the one hand, you had a tendency or yes, by those who privilege or to claim, who claim to privilege the principle of presumption of innocence, and sometimes and tend to downplay the allegations as a trap or as being instrumentalized to attack powerful politicians. And on the other hand, you had those who assumed that the case was just the tip of an iceberg exposing the impunity of national political elites. 
Now, moving to the Tilleides case. Uh, the coverage of the Tilleides rapist exemplifies the difficulty of, in imagining sexual offenders beyond the above-mentioned profile identified uh, in the work of Isabel Ventura. Uh, the serial rapist admitted having committed around 40 rapes uh, at knife point in the Great Lisbon area in 2008 2009. Most victims were underage girls. Though the media had reported on the crimes before his arrest in March 2010, the peak of the coverage occurred afterwards and in association with the bewilderment triggered by the disclosure of his identity. He was a 30-year-old data analysis, an analyst studying chemical industry, living in a recently purchased flat with his long-term girlfriend, whom he was planning to marry. The piece Enrique Sotero, ID, Life, Interests, Crimes, File, Evidence, Investigation and Punishment, published in the mainstream newspaper Diario de Noticias in 2010, just opposes a detailed portrait of him as a respectable and well-integrated normal man, so job, good grades, hobbies, healthy habits, long-term relationship, and so on, with the violence and the cruelty of his crimes. The reference to what might have been experienced in his childhood as the traumatic divorce of his parents, alongside references to his schizophrenic mother, offers readers a way of making sense of that discursive dissonance through patholization. Indeed, the media coverage focused on the one hand on the shock experienced by his family and acquaintances, and on the other, on the explanation of his deeds through psychology. The fact that he himself had sought a psychologist in 2009 to try to control his sexual urges is reinforced this narrative. By not, so what was missing? So you can say what was missing from the media coverage. So by not inquiring about the long-term effects on his victims, uh, the reasons why so many of them did not even file a police report, nor critically discussing the widespread bewilderment caused by the revelation of his identity, media did not challenge the rape myths, which exclude successful men like him from the imaginary of the rapist. The Tilleires rapist gives, indeed, considerable, considerable media visibility to sexual violence. However, since media framed the story as a tragedy falling upon his inner circle and himself, and not on the victims, uh, uh, on himself as a victim of his own pathology, sexual violence as a social phenomena entangled in constructions of masculinity and sexuality remain largely unarticulated. Now, moving to the Gaia case. On September 2018, a verdict involving a sexual crime in a disco in Gaia near Porto triggered widespread attention and criticism. The victim was in an alcoholic coma and her assailants, a barkeeper and a bouncer, were sentenced for sexual abuse instead of rape. The verdict referred as mitigating factors the fact that the woman did not suffer serious physical injuries, there had been a climate of seduction before the crime, and the aggressors were well integrated in society. The verdict seemed to echo the broad understandings of much of the national culture of gender relations. At the same time, it was met with widespread anger and criticism of the judiciary. The media coverage, especially if we consider quality media outlets such as Publico, reveals that there were efforts to discuss the implications of the verdict and raise awareness to the problem of sexual violence. The case was used to scrutinize prevailing legal practices and a significant part of the coverage focused on feminist protests reproducing activists' criticism and understandings of rape. 
our interviews conducted in, in the project Decodem, so our interviews conducted in 2020 with 31 journalists suggest that media professionals have an extremely negative perception of the main judge involved in the case. When we ask them to comment, uh, to, to to, to comment on, on this judge, uh, uh, they would say, they would associate him with outdated morals. And some of the wording that was used to describe him was uh, medieval, cavernous, outdated, out of step with reality, ignorant, sexist, and even what we have to change. So basically what we have to change. So unfortunately, there is no time uh, to examine the media coverage uh, of the rape allegations against uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. As you probably uh, remember, there was widespread support for this national icon in tandem with the narrative, uh, a man like him does not need to rape. Uh, I will refer here to some, uh, only to some of our or articles. Some people on the on the team uh, of Uncover have worked, have published about um, about Cristiano Ronaldo. Here, our publications are on Cristiano Ronaldo and on the Gaia uh, verdict. Um, and so, uh, to conclude, uh, what do these four mediatic cases say about how sexual violence is covered in Portuguese mainstream media? Uh, a broader analysis of sexual violence news coverage in Portugal exposes a heterogeneous picture marked by the co coexistence of divergent and contradictory practices. On the one hand, you have sensationalism, voyeurism, reproduction of ingrained rape myths and lack of commitment to social change. On the other hand, you can notice, we can see as well, that there are increasing efforts to mediate rape through feminist lenses as a social problem related to gender inequality and broader forms of violence against women. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention.